Mr. Yi, Mr. Bolito here, Mr. Vishnu Wardana, Mr. Marwa Sirait, and I apologize if I don't mention all the distinguished attendees. It will take a full half an hour, I think, <laughs> of your excellencies. Uh, first of all, I would like to express uh, the great honor that I uh, receive in being invited to this forum. It's the first uh, such event that uh, I was invited to in all these years. Uh, so, actually, I was a bit uh, hesitant in uh, attending, but I understood that this was some sort of uh, instruction from my boss, so <laughs> it, <laughs> one thing I learned in my uh, long career is the golden rule. Golden rule number one, the boss is always right. <laughs> golden rule number two, if he's wrong, refer to golden rule number one. <laughs> and number three, uh, be grateful that he's your boss. So, uh, I attend today, and uh, I would like to uh, make some comments. I would like to, first of all, express my uh, admiration for the performance of Bank Mandiri. Yes, I, I'm proud of Bank Mandiri as an Indonesian. I understand that Bank Mandiri is, uh, what, number 300 from the Forbes Global 500, right? So, not bad, right? And because I have a personal, emotional tie with Bank Mandiri, I was a client of Bank Mandiri. many years ago, and uh, I think uh, my record in Bank Mandiri is not too bad, <laughs> Pak Darmawan, right? Yeah. Right? I paid 100% of my debt, 100%, no haircut, no haircut, I think maybe in the history of Indonesia, I think one of the few clients who paid his debt, 100%. And I would like to commend Bank Mandiri. I understand your NPA, NPL is one of the lowest, perhaps the lowest in Indonesia, and one of the lowest in Asia also. So uh, I think uh, as a citizen of Indonesia, I would like to once again express my appreciation because uh, what you are managing is the money of the people of Indonesia. This is a great responsibility for you and you have done well and I commend you for that and uh, I would like to express to you that you must continue on this great path of performance. Uh, my own grandfather was one of, I think he was the first CEO of the first state-owned bank of Indonesia. And uh, <coughs> therefore, I think I would like to see this tradition of responsible management of responsible accountability to the interest of the people of Indonesia be strengthened and be continued. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I stand here before you actually uh, to express to you again that in the context of what we saw in the video, I think all of you are more expert than me in the world of finance, investment, <laughs> etc. But for me, economics, finance is actually very basic. I think the economy of a country must address the need, first of all, of the people of that country. And uh, one thing that I am convinced of in my career is that every people in every part of the world, whatever nation, whatever race, whatever religion, whatever economic and political philosophy, every people in the world desire the same basic things. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is a common interest of humanity. And one thing that I am very convinced of being an amateur historian, being a student of history, being a former soldier, one thing I am convinced of, there the people of all the world, especially I'm convinced, my people, but I think all your peoples also, desire prosperity. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness means prosperity. Every country, every nation, every people desire this. That means every leader of every country must aspire to bringing prosperity to their people. Whatever political ideology, whatever platform, whatever origin of our aspiration, every leader of every country must aspire to achieve prosperity. And as a student of history, I must say that I am now convinced more than ever in my study of history, in my experience of my own country's history, there can be no prosperity without peace. Therefore, the duty of every government and every leader is to try to achieve peace, to maintain peace in order to bring prosperity. As every simple trader in the most simple market in the most simple village of Indonesia will testify. If there is tension, if there is turmoil, if there is a deterioration in the peace of the country, the trader cannot carry out his livelihood. 
if the trader cannot go to the market and sell his goods, who will buy the produce of the farmer? Who will buy and sell the produce of the fishermen? Where can the common people buy their basic needs? So the economy, I think, must, in my opinion, refer to this basic fact. Peace and stability is the key to prosperity. And that is the challenge that every country has to go through. And uh, I think Indonesians must be proud. We have gone through tremendous challenges. Our independence we got through many, many years of fighting for our independence. We did not get our independence as a present. We had to fight in many parts of Indonesia. When we achieved our independence through a war in which I think nearly all families of Indonesia have experience of losing one of their ancestors or their grandparents or their parents in this struggle for independence. After we achieved sovereignty, we still had to fight rebellions from the ideological spectrum, from the extreme right to the extreme left, foreign incursions, foreign interventions. So let us now be proud that we have overcome most of these challenges. In the last 25 years, we transitioned from a strong authoritarian regime to a full-fledged democracy. And I think we are now acknowledged as one of the biggest democracies in the world. We have carried out several uh, elections. I would say uh, real elections. I think I have a lot of experience in uh, participating in these elections. I think I participated in five general elections. And let me attest, let me testify that democracy is really very, very tiring. <laughs> democracy is very, very messy. Democracy is very, very costly. And we are still not satisfied with our democracy. There is a lot of room for improvement. But also let us not have this inferiority complex of always feeling that we are inferior to everybody. I think Indonesia must be proud. In our elections, the turnout is 80%. On average, 80%, which is not bad, considering many countries in the home of democracy, sometimes the turnout is less than 
and also the the size of our country, the vastness of our country. 17,000 islands spanning the, the length of Western Europe. The fourth largest population in the world. For, me, for instance, in this last election, I could not visit all the provinces of Indonesia. From the 38 provinces, I only managed to visit, I think it was only the last count was 26. So I still, uh, after this election, I still have to go to the rest of the provinces because I think it was also a promise that the provinces that I could not attend during the campaign, I will come after the campaign. What I'm saying, what I, my point is that Indonesia is a, is a country with great aspirations. My people, my nation have great aspirations. We have great problems. We have great challenges. But we have great aspirations. And we try to achieve those aspirations. We have 820,000 voting stations. 820,000 voting stations. And we carried out five, five elections on the same day. Election of the president, election of the national parliament, the provincial parliament, the district parliament, the kabupatens, and the cities, and also our regional chamber, which could be maybe uh, equated with the Senate in many countries. Five electors in the same day. 820,000 voting stations and everything without any violence, without any incident. <laughs> and we are carrying out all the processes. Yeah. There are reports of misdemeanors, etc. Everything will be investigated and will be addressed. In the midst of all this, in the midst of all the challenges, the last being the 98 economic meltdown in Asia, in East Asia. After that, our transition to a full democracy. And after that, we had the 2008 financial crisis. And after that, we had the pandemic, COVID. And we have now the geopolitical uncertainty everywhere, which will provide an impact on the economic situation of many countries. Indonesia still managed to weather all these challenges and everybody must acknowledge that we have done not too bad. We still maintain growth after a pandemic. One of the most vibrant, I think, growth in the world. We have maintained our inflation, low, one of the lowest in the world. Not bad eh, for Indonesia. And we have maintained a good, prudent economic and fiscal management. I think uh, Indonesia has a good record. We have never defaulted in our economic history. The debts of former regimes have always been honored and cleared by succeeding regimes. Even though they were perhaps ideologically and diametrically opposed. All the debts of the Sukarno era had been honored 
by the Suharto regime. All the deaths under the Suharto regime have been honored by succeeding government. That is our tradition because in our culture, it is very bad. In fact, it is a taboo to not honor your debt. Our, our uh, trade balance has been positive for what? The last five years? Tremendous, but Perry, thank uh, you. And uh, our uh, reserves are are very healthy, although it, it must be better in the coming years, right? We are determined to uh, maintain this trajectory. We are this uh, proven record of prudent and wise management. I think is very essential. Because we see in many parts of the world, for instance, inflation sometimes very difficult to control. So we are very uh, determined to be vigilant. I think the government of President Jokowi is quite successful and maybe unique in managing inflation creatively right, uh, by attention to detail, by micromanagement. As you know, I was many years opposing Pak Joko Widodo, many years, and uh, he defeated me twice. You see, Indonesians laugh when somebody feels sad. <laughs> but I think they laugh because they sympathize with me. But you know one thing that I uh, learned as a soldier, former soldier, we respect a strong opponent. That is the unique psychology and culture of a real warrior, a real knight. When we are faced with a strong opponent, we respect him, especially after he defeated us. And we try to learn how was I defeated. And again, the age-old advice of many of our forefathers, if you can't beat him, why don't you join him? Especially if he offers and asks and invites us to join him. That was not an easy decision. Many of my close supporters uh, were, became angry at me as if I sold out. But in the end, I sensed from the early days that the elements, the values that President Joko Widodo was fighting for were basically the same values that I was fighting for. And when we learn from history, we tend to ask ourselves, if we are fighting for the same value, why don't we combine for the good of the people. Because we want to serve the people. President Jokowi, his focus is always the good of the people, especially the poor and the weak. 
that is also my focus. I was many years a soldier of the Indonesian National Army. The Indonesian National Army is a people's army. Many people in many societies, especially in the West, do not understand this. Our army is a revolutionary army. The army rose. The army was not commissioned by any king, by any sultan, no. The army rose, village by village, town by town, city by city. The first commanders of the Indonesian army were elected. They elected their own company commanders, their own battalion commanders, their own armed forces commander. That's the history of the Indonesian army. Therefore, any officer of the Indonesian army depend on the people. In the first years of the Indonesian War of Independence, there was no budget, there was no Minister of Defense, there was no Minister of Finance, there was not a parliament, we did not have a currency. How did our soldiers eat? The village people gave food. Even in 1970, as a young cadet, I experienced the poor villagers. When we trained in the villages and the mountains, they gave us food. They give us water, they give us tea. And they were living in huts. This is the close bond between the Indonesian people and the military and the army. My point is, in the end, every Indonesian leader must consistently and consciously strive to better the livelihood of the people. And that is why I joined forces with Jokowi against advice of many of our supporters. And in the process of me joining him, I learned a lot. I understood the mechanism. I saw his policies. His policies uh, what we call is uh, taking sides. In every policy, we have to ask, who do we serve? Who do we take sides with? I am convinced that every responsible leader must defend his people and must defend the weakest elements and the poorest elements of society. A few years ago, maybe several decades ago, there are those who who always espouse the greatness of one sort of economic philosophy. There's a certain thinking that the poor are weak and there's a certain philosophy that champion the thinking of survival of the fittest, some sort of social Darwinism. If you are poor, you are weak. The responsibility of a government actually is only to regulate. The responsibility of a government is basically some sort of referee, some sort of watchdog. But there must be free, free fight. Another philosophy says that a government, a leader is responsible to defend his people. And that's the Indonesian tradition. We have to take care of our poor, of our weak, and of our hungry. 
economic growth just for economic growth without addressing poverty and hunger I do not think is viable. We need growth, we need wealth, we need prosperity because we have to create jobs. We have to support trade, support commerce, support business. This is the philosophy, the ancient wisdom of our history. The duty of a government is to enhance, promote commerce, promote trade, to create wealth, so that with the wealth, we can help those who are left behind. So I think this is the philosophy of Pan Jokowi, which in two terms, I think, has proven relevant. As I said, all the macro indicators, you know more than me, right? We are vibrant, we are growing, and I am optimistic. By talking not only with economic experts, I talk with the players. I talk with the economic players of all levels, from the top taipans to the middle, to the cooperatives, to the village traders. By the way, I was chairman of the Traditional Traders Association for many, many years. I'm still board of patron of that organization, which represent, I think, something like what, 16,000 traditional markets. So. I get input from all this, and I come out with, uh, with a view that I am very bullish, I am very optimistic. We will continue the policies of Joko Widodo, which has been proven relevant, and we will add on to those policies in the same trajectory. We will improve what needs to be improved. We acknowledge there's still too much wastage, there's still too much inefficiency. We must have better management, we must have more efficient uh, structure, we must have uh, more vigilant overwatch, we must cut down on corruption, but that is the, <coughs> the beauty or the, the optimism that technology has brought us. With digital technology, we will have a stronger Oversight, we will have easier check and balance. We can have faster accountability. We will cut a lot of inefficiency and wastage. So, basically, gentlemen, inshallah, I will be inaugurated in October. 20th. And uh, I think the transition will be very smooth because, as you know, of the three candidates, my team is very open that we say that we are part of Jokowi's team. We are not shy, and we say, if, especially in the military, if your azimuth 
when you navigate the difficult terrain and the azimuth is bringing you closer and closer to your to your objective why take a risk in changing azimuths there will be an obstacle yes we can overcome that obstacle there will be a ravine yes we have to overcome the ravine but the azimuth the direction is clear We are blessed with a lot of resources, but we must be capable in managing those resources so that those resources are used wisely and will be used by our future generations. People talk about climate change, environment, dangers that we are experiencing it nobody has to lecture us we are experiencing day by day in the northern coast of java in the northern coast of this jakarta my people are living every day with water up to their knees in their bedrooms this we must address and this we will address i'm determined to address that we cannot be a member of the g20 and our people are living in such conditions therefore ladies and gentlemen we are, I am very bullish, my team is very bullish. I speak with all the uh, stakeholders, yes. Uh, they are very bullish. Uh, we have a lot of uh, programs. And uh, we have a lot of strength. We have fundamental strength, which needs only good management with the help of technology. For instance, our tax ratio can be much improved. I think we are now around, is it 10% now? Yes, 10%. And our neighbors are at 16%. Thailand, yeah, Malaysia at 16. Vietnam, Cambodia, they're around 16, 17, 18 room for improvement Pak Eric ya Pak Darmawan Pak Kartiko Pak Khatib please give me a recommendation who will be the director general of tax <laughs> right but being a former businessman actually I'm still a businessman you know how can I finance my campaign right <laughs> a lot of journalists around here yeah? okay uh, what I'm saying is if Thailand can achieve 16 percent tax ratio if Malaysia can if Vietnam can if Cambodia can why cannot Indonesia that is my question to all the managers, the economic experts, please let us, not in the sense that we have to increase taxes. No, we have to widen the, the tax, what do you call it, the tax uh, payers, right? And I think this can be done. If from 10%, we can increase to 16% like Thailand, 6% of 1,500 billion dollars GDP. That's significant, right? That is what? Uh, 
90 billion dollars. 90 billion dollars. We have now, I think, one of the lowest uh, ratio of government spending to GDP. One of the lowest in the world. Uh, the last figure was 15.5 percent government spending to GDP. We have also the lowest, I think, uh, debt to GDP ratio. I think we are now at 39 percent. 39 percent. We are well under the mandatory 3 percent uh, cap on our uh, lending. 3 percent eh? uh, by mandatory for our deficit towards GDP. We are now, even now, at present, it's about 2 percent. Projected, I think we can easily go to 2.6, 2.8 percent. And we will still be under this mandatory 3 percent ceiling, which is actually, basically, we adopted from the European Union, from the Maastricht Treaty, I think. And interestingly, many strong countries of the European Union do not maintain the old, their own cap. I think uh, France is around 6.8% of GDP. Germany is also around 6%. Italy is around 8%. So Indonesia, not bad. So I must uh, again commend all the economic managers and fiscal managers of this government and the previous governments. So I think this tradition is very strong in our uh, the back of our mind, and that's why I uh, would like to maintain this close cooperation between the top players of industry and commerce, between the bankers, financial system, the government political leaders, the middle and uh, weakest part of the economy, small enterprises, yeah. Uh, UMKM, yeah, uh, the middle and small enterprises, the cooperatives, the cooperatives of the farmers, the fishermen, the traders. I think our approach is a collaboration, cooperation between all these economic players. We do not want a zero-sum game. We want a collaborative effort. Our strategy is not a zero-sum game, not winner takes all, but we want win, 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 win. That is what we want. We are open for investment. We would like to see more investment, and in order to attract investment, as I said, I am of the opinion that we must clean up our act, improve, once again I said, efficiency, mitigate, if possible, eliminate, but at least mitigate more and more corrupt practices, <coughs> enforce the enforce the law, assure all investors, foreign and domestic, they will get the best protection and the best uh, 
perlakuan ya, the best uh, apa perlakuan the best treatment under the law forgive me because I've been campaigning all these months my English has been a bit uh, a bit what do you call it eh? rough uh, going forward as I said we will continue the the good and wise policies of the current government. Even my coalition, the government uh, now is, the, the name of the present cabinet is Cabinet uh, Indonesia Maju. Right? My coalition is Koalisi Indonesia Maju. So basically, it's the same, uh, the same breed, I think. We will improve what we have to improve. We will embark on better initiatives, new initiatives that will build on the strong foundation that's laid by the previous presidents. Uh, we will strive to have a green economy. We are blessed. We can have bio uh, fuel. We can have our diesel from uh, palm oil, we can have our uh, gasoline from ethanol, we will have uh, ethanol from, um, from sugar, also from tapioca, cassava. We have some challenges, but we are optimistic. Uh, we will be self-sufficient very fast in, uh, in our food. I think we will be exporting uh, food within four years. Within three years, we will be self-sufficient. After four years, we will be exporting food. We must learn from the best practices of many countries. China very uh, performed very well in eradicating uh, poverty. India, once we see India in the media with famines, etc., now India is one of the biggest exporter of food in the world. We must learn from the best practices of India, of China, how to alleviate poverty from many countries around the world. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm convinced, basically, I'm personally convinced that uh, we can boost our growth. My own uh, estimate is within uh, the next four or five years, we can achieve 8% growth, maybe more. Yes. Uh, I think that basically concludes the remarks that I want to make. Once again, uh, very proud of Mandiri. Uh, please continue your good performance and uh, manage our uh, assets as wisely and as prudently as possible. That's also the guiding principle of the next Indonesian government. We want growth, but we want to overcome poverty. We want to create jobs. We want to get rid of hunger. And uh, the way forward is very clear. We will push efficiency. We will push rational decision making. There can be no distortion of the economy. We 
you must carry out best practices. And we are very optimistic we can carry that out. We will look for the best and the brightest of Indonesians. We will work democratically, but we will not be shy from taking decisive actions because the present age has created a new phenomena. The poorest of the poor knows what is happening. With the technology, with IT, with social media, with TikTok, the most remote part of Indonesia know what is happening. They know who is fighting for them. And they cannot be manipulated easily anymore. So, I think uh, that concludes my remarks. We are open for business. We would like to invest investment from everywhere. What can be done by the private sector, we must allow the private sector to do it. State-owned enterprise by Eric, yeah, we must uh, rationalize. Uh, if there's no real strategic reason, maybe we have to really have a program of rationalizing and privatizing many of the state-owned enterprises. The state can regulate, the state can oversight, the state must also have a strategic decision-making in the strategic sectors. But basically, I don't see, for instance, why we need to be present in every sector of the economy, right? I mean, uh, I think uh, tourism in the 50s, the government has to take a pioneering role. But now I think we must allow the private sector to be more and more uh, dominant. If possible, we don't need, I think, state-owned hotels, I think. What do you think, pa Eric? <laughs> Huh? But I, I'll, I'll ask for your advice. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I want to take a rational and common sense approach. And I need all the advice I could get. And therefore, you know, I, I want the best input. So please, uh, ladies and gentlemen from this forum, actually, if I have time, I would like to sit and hear the panelists. So maybe I come incognito later on this afternoon. <laughs> I think that's it. I think I mentioned in conclusion six times already. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency, for your remarks. Please remain on the stage as we will proceed with the token.